is from Acts 20 from verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except knowing, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. <clears throat> Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all these things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It's more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. For the reading, Maronki and uh, Tim, for the prayer. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I think we've got our own psalmist in our midst. His prayer rhymed. The first thing that, uh, that um, Justin said to me after Tim prays is, It all rhymed! It all rhymed. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Um, well, let's just close our eyes and uh, commit ourselves to the Lord as we consider His word this morning. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that you have enabled us to, to hear your voice, Jesus, as the shepherds, um, as the sheep of, of your flock. Uh, you, the, the head shepherd, you have enabled us by your Spirit to, to hear your voice and to, to understand it and to react to it and to follow it. And uh, I pray that that will be the case this morning as we hear you speak to us through your word i pray that you will please help me uh, to take a, a couple of chapters and narrow it down to an essential part i pray that you will help me to proclaim your word faithfully and boldly for your glory's sake amen well, let me let me start by by just saying a couple of things about life I mean, life, life teaches us that uh, we cannot do everything and we certainly cannot please everyone. The nature of society is increasing array of choices. It, it just pulls us in so many directions, doesn't it? The needs of people around us compels us to respond to more expectations than what we can possibly bear ourselves. That is why we need clear priorities 
clear priorities. Priorities are commitments we put first in our lives because we believe that they are important. The key word here is commitments. Basic areas of our life that we focus on, which we dedicate large portions of our time and our energy and our resources to. These commitments will ultimately determine what you live for. Now for the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at Paul's first and, and second missionary journey. And uh, today we will consider this third missionary journey, um, Acts chapter 19 through to 21. But I want to focus particularly on chapter 20, verse 24, which I think is a key verse for us to, to get our heads around a little bit. Now each missionary journey that Paul went on had a, a certain uniqueness about it. The first was characterized by tremendous opposition uh, to the gospel to such an extent that, that Paul almost lost his life. They, he was dragged out, he was stoned, he was left for dead. He almost lost his life. The second missionary journey was characterized by the gospel's effectiveness in Macedonia, a place that was known for its prosperous, sophisticated, intellectual kind of people. So the obvious question to us is, how is the gospel going to fare in such a society? And we saw that the gospel, uh, it did very well. It converted people to Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel. What characterized this third missionary journey is the provision and establishment of leaders. And as I see the children go, if there's other children who want to go play, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if you want to stay, you're also welcome to do so. It's up to the parents. I'll leave that up to you. But what characterized this third missionary journey was the establishment, the giving off and the establishment of leaders. And we see it in Acts chapter 18 that where we read about Apollos. So all of a sudden there's this person that comes along. Apollos, there's nothing said of him before. But here's this man who comes along and he is well schooled in God's word. And he boldly proclaims the gospel in the synagogues to the Jews. And what fascinates me is just before this, Paul really struggled in proclaiming the gospel to the Jews. There are a couple of instances where he said, I'm dusting off my shoes from you and I'm leaving you and I'm going to the Gentiles. And you see this, the struggle within Paul to carry on. But just after that, God encourages Paul and says, don't stop talking in a city. There's many in a city that belongs to me. Carry on. And he carries on. But you see the starting of, of a struggle for Paul in going to the synagogues and continuing ministering to the Jews. Um, you see him going more to the Gentiles. But what fascinates me is that all of a sudden, God provides Apollos. And he's a man who powerfully refutes the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. God provided Apollos. Now in Acts chapter 19, Paul came to Ephesus and he found 12 disciples in Ephesus who were who he baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and who began speaking in different languages the works of God, the things about God. And, and Paul took them with him, chapter 19, verse 9, for two years. And he, and he reasoned daily in the, in the hall of Tyrannus. Tyrannus. Sure. I wonder what the parents were thinking when they called this child Tyrannus. It means tyrant. <laughs> Who wants to call a child tyrant? I don't think anybody wants to do that. But uh, they called this person ty Tyrannus or Tyrant, Tyrannus. And this hall was, had his name. And in this hall, Paul was for two years teaching God's word, proclaiming the gospel so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now that is tremendous. All the people in Asia could hear the word of the Lord. The Hall of Tyrannus, there's a little bit of history here. The Hall of Tyrannus was a lecture hall that uh, traveling philosophers would rent out to, for, for a time to, to, to basically proclaim their idea of life. One early Greek manuscript states that Paul reasoned daily in the Hall of Tyrannus from the 5th to the, ninth, or to the 10th hour, which is basically from 11 a.m. in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 
So Paul and his disciples, the 12 disciples, they rented the school of Tyrannus from 11 o'clock till 4 o'clock in the afternoon and proclaimed the gospel. But why that time? Well, a bit of history here because the working hours in Ephesus were from about 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock in the morning and then they will take a break. They will have this siesta for five hours. Wouldn't you like that? For five hours, they had a siesta time. Uh, from 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock and from 4 o'clock they carried on working okay don't go to sleep yet until 10 o'clock in the evening so here's Paul and his disciples and they rented out this place now think about that for a second Paul worked as a tent maker from 7 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock in the morning and from 11 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he reasoned, he taught in the hall of Tyrannus the gospel, proclaimed God's word from 11 to 4 o'clock. And then he would return to work as a tent maker until whatever time, possibly till 10 o'clock as well with everybody else. And as seen in chapter 20 verse 7, he would preach on the first day of the week, Sunday, he would preach the gospel, he would preach God's word. And, and on occasion, as we can see in chapter 20, he would even preach until midnight. And then a poor man fell out of the window, fell asleep. I don't think that had anything to do with Paul's preaching. So hopefully no one falls asleep here this morning. But until midnight, he would proclaim. So what do you see there? You see a commitment in Paul. And, what, and you can see what Paul lived for through his commitments. He was a man who lived for something and he expressed that through his commitments and he not only showed it he also communicated it for us and we have that here for us in scripture where I want to draw your attention to this morning in a chapter that was read for us by Maranki chapter 20 Paul addressed these 12 disciples that he that he that came from Ephesus that he spent two years with in a and Tyrannus as he proclaimed the gospel and God's word to the rest of the people and some of the men that mentioned a little bit earlier on in chapter 20 he, he addressed them the 12 disciples who now became elders and some of the other elders mentioned earlier on and he's he's basically giving a farewell address to these leaders and in this address he's basically saying goodbye to them but he, he's also admonishing them and he's saying to them pay attention to your life and be alert basically pay attention to your life and pray Pay attention to what you teach, pay attention to how you live and pray. And be careful to pay attention to God's flock in the same way, to their way of life and pray. Now Paul is, Paul is certain that hardship and imprisonment is waiting for him, even a possibility of death. But look at what he says in chapter 20 verse 24. He makes a tremendously bold statement of commitment here of what he lived for here so i'm on my way to jerusalem i do not know exactly what's going to happen to me there but i know that hardship is waiting for me i know that imprisonment is waiting for me but then he says verse 24 but i do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only i may finish my course and the ministry that i receive from the lord jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of god to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, this is a statement that shows us what Paul lived for and the effect that that had on his life. And this is where I'd like to pause with you this morning as we consider this. Um, consider not only what Paul lived for and the effect that it had on his life, but what we are living for. And the effect it has on our lives so let's start by looking at the end of the verse Paul lived for the reality of God the verse ends with that great reality to testify to the gospel of the grace of God so since we come from God and are made for God you can be certain of this that any priority that you choose to live for will leave you craving in your soul if God is not the end goal guiding and, and shaping your choices. 
Let me say that again. Since we come from God and are made for God, you can be certain of this, that any priority that you choose to live for will leave you craving in your soul. If God is not the end goal, guiding and shaping your choices. Navigators, they would often use the, the pole star as the, the brightest star that appears nearest to the northern pole to determine latitude and to determine direction, north and south direction over the northern hemisphere. It is a star that guides them in the direction that they need to take. God was Paul's pole star, if you will, that navigated and guided Paul's life. And the glory of God was the light of that star. And as that light of God's, God's glory shone over Paul's life, all of Paul's other aims of life, of life was like a, a dim light simply reflecting from that pole star. Everything else was in perspective under God's glory. God being the pole star, God being the, the guiding factor, God being the goal of Paul's life. The second thing that we see Paul living for here is, is the grace of God. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. John Piper gives this image. The power of God's holiness and justice are like a great violent hurricane. And the grace of God is like the eye of the hurricane where all peace and calm resides. Grace is at the center of God's reality. Grace giving you what you do not deserve, unmerited favor and love is, in the, is the essential calm at the center of the hurricane of God's holiness and God's perfection. At the center of that is grace. Paul was once swept into, into that terror of that hurricane on the road to Damascus. But then, all, being all amazed, he was drawn into that center, that calm, that peace. Paul would say that, and it's fascinating when you, when you read through Paul's letters, he would say that, I, I'm the chief of sinners. What, fasc what fascinates me about that is that he would begin by saying, I'm a sinner. And one of his last letters to the church, he would say, I'm the chief of sinners. It's like he almost grew in awareness of his sin more and more. And isn't that true for Christians, believers? You, you come to the Lord Jesus and you are overwhelmed by your sinfulness. And the more you get to know him, the more you realize how utterly sinful you really are. In a, in a minutest and the greatest of, de of depth of details in our lives. I was the greatest of sinners, Paul would say, but I was drawn into that eye of grace where there's peace from God. Thirdly, notice that Paul lived for the reality of the gospel. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. God, God is a reality that, that you as a human being needs to deal with. He's a reality. His grace is a reality. Rescuing sinners from that hurricane of holiness and perfections where we don't match up. And there's wrath. And there's judgment. But in that eye of grace, there's peace. But we need to deal with that. We need to deal with the fact that God is a reality and that His holiness is a reality. And judgment is a reality. But it's also grace. And this message is a message to all the world that these things are true. True realities. An awesome and holy God exists. And there's a way to safety and intimacy through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. All who submit to Him and trust in Him and in what He has accomplished on the cross will be rescued and drawn to the side of God where there's a place given for us, seated in Christ, a place of grace and intimacy, a place of peace. You know, the words that God spoke to Jesus when He was baptized rings true for all those who would place their faith in Jesus. I am well pleased with you because I'm in Christ. It's a place of peace, not of judgment. This is the gospel. It's good news. 
Lastly, Paul lived to testify, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, to profess, to, to speak and to preach the gospel, to bear uh, a constant and public testimony uh, to the point of death, as in life, that this is true. The gospel is a reality. God is a reality. And he declared it and stand by the gospel with absolute certainty to testify. See, this is what Paul lived for. The end of verse 24, Paul was making a life statement. A cause worth living for. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now take a moment. And look at how this affected his life. It made him indifferent to earthly gain. Verse 24 begins in a certain way. It says, I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. See, God had given him something to live for that was so satisfying that it was more valuable than his own life. Secondly, he gave him incredible commitment. The verse says that he valued one thing more than life. If only I may accomplish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. See, he pictures himself as an athlete running a race and, he, and his coach and his trainer and his audience and his reward is Jesus himself, Jesus Christ. One thing matters to Paul. Finishing the course the way that he has been taught. Paul lived to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This priority in his life made him indifferent to earthly gain and it gave him incredible commitment. Now, when we read this, when we think about this, when we consider Paul, a mistake we can make is to say that, well, that's Paul. And that's what the Bible tells us about Paul's life. But it's God's word to you to me yes it's about Paul but when you read the Bible you don't read just about people it's there to reflect you it's there to encourage you it's a story it's your story it's God's story that encourages you that that invites you to read and say this is part of your life this is your story so when we consider Paul we have to ask ourselves those questions as, the, as we look at Paul and see what priorities were, were in his life, what commitments he had in life, we've got to ask those questions to ourselves. What is the biggest priority in your life? What are you living for? What does your commitments reveal to you about what you live for? Paul Tripp would often say, if I would take a video of your life for the past week, what would it tell me about where your commitments are, what you live for? What's your priorities? Where are your commitments? What, how does it, what does it reveal about what you live for? Can I encourage you this morning to not, how can I put this, to, to not dichotomize your life too much. Many of us go through life sort of cutting our lives in bits and pieces uh, this is my school time uh, this is my 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 work time this is my study time this is my family time this is my leisure time this is my quiet time that's my church time um, and then and then with each of those areas there there are certain commitments that we give ourselves to we sort of partialize if you will our lives into a variety of areas what is the greatest priority of your life that can unite all of those areas of your life? What is the one thing that you can live for that can be like a golden thread woven through all of those areas of your life? So that all of these areas and commitments to them can be a reflection of that one great commitment. That one great priority. Don't you think it can be the same as Paul? God and His glory are greatest priority through every aspect of our life. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God 
the overarching commitment, the overarching cause of life for every aspect of our life. When you begin to see all of these areas of our lives through the lens of God and His glory and, uh, and, and to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, then all of a sudden your life changes. Work is no longer just work anymore. Going to school is no longer just going to school anymore. Studying is no longer just studying anymore. Raising children is no longer just raising children anymore. All of a sudden there's purpose. Bigger than you. Bigger than this world. There's direction. There's guidance. There's a cause. All of a sudden there's a greater cause, a greater purpose, a more significant life. You know, the older you get, and I'm not even that old yet, but I'm reaching my 50s almost this year actually. But um, the more I think of my life, the more I realize how, how quickly it is, how sudden it is. How much more so in our, our current context where 55,000 people have died due to a pandemic in South Africa. It's like this. What are you willing to live for in that moment? What would be the cause for your life for that moment? What will be the priority of your life for that moment? Because that moment is just that moment in this lifespan of eternity. What's the priority? What's the cause? That can be an overarching cause, an overarching priority of all of your life. Every single area that weaves them all together in a beautiful way. Many of us may have started off in this way. God's my priority, the gospel, proclaiming it, living for it. But along the way, we, we I don't know, we became lukewarm. We, we start failing. Our commitment started dwindling. And when we look at other believers reaching their goals, living out their commitment to God and, and, and sharing the gospel wherever they go and, and telling people about how great and how good God is for them. I've got this one friend, whenever we, they come to visit us, you can be sure of it that he's going to tell you something about what God has done in their lives. Tremendous. It's like God fo God's focus is there in all of his conversation. It's amazing. It's always encouraging for me. You know, some of us has dwindled on this. Some of us has become lukewarm and we see others come past us. Let me tell you this story. There's a great mountain in the Alps. Um, and it, and this, this mountain has become quite a popular mountain for climbers. And the reason why it became so popular is because halfway up there's a, there's a rest stop. Uh, quite a leisure place. Halfway up. And so if you start in the morning, from base camp you would reach that halfway rest stop by afternoon by by about lunchtime and over the years the owner of the rest stop has noticed an interesting phenomena as people have stopped there to rest before they carried on when climbers would get to that point they feel the warmth of the fire and they smell the good food and they begin to relax um, in their surroundings in that rest place and often they will tell their companions to climb on without them. <laughs> we'll head back to base camp on the way back when you come back. We'll wait for you and on the way back we'll head back to base camp with you. And a, a glazed look of contentment comes over them as they sit by the fire and play piano and sing mountain climbing songs to one another. And in the meantime, the rest of the group get their gear and they trek up. The mountain. For the next couple of hours the owner says that happiness fills the air in the house. But as the owner says by mid-afternoon it starts to become quite quiet in the house. The climbers who stayed behind will begin taking turns looking out the windows staring at the top of the mountain. They're silent as they watch their friends reach their goal 
and the atmosphere changes from one of merriment to an almost funeral funeral like quietness as I realized that they forgot their commitment and settled for second best they missed their goal the climbers who went on had before them the goal and the priority to reach the mountain top they lived for the climb it made them indifferent to the leisure of the halfway halfway house the, the rest stop and it gave them incredible commitment to finish what they have started many of us may be sitting in that lounge at the rest stop maybe even peering out the windows looking at others heading up the mountain reaching their goal is it too late to start the climb again to continue with the climb is it too late it is not too late to repent it is never too late to turn it's not too late to repent from things that that we have exalted above God to be our priority in life and his cause and his call on our lives I think it's John Piper who says you know ministry is for each and every Christian the the call to to live out the gospel and to proclaim the gospel is for each and every Christian that's our mountain that we're climbing as believers in Jesus Christ and as long as you are alive it's never too late to continue climbing that mountain Jesus said come to me all who are weary and heavy laden by all of what this world asks and demands of us and I will give you rest I will give you true rest but then he continues right and he says this take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy uh, i.e. there's work to be done Christian my yoke is easy and my burden is light live for me live for my cause have before you what I regard as the greatest priority and you will find rest you will find satisfaction for your souls Jesus can enable us to turn Jesus is the giver of repentance he accomplished that for us on the cross it's there where we can go and lay down I don't know our sense of or over desires for comfort for ease and he can enable us to take the next step up the mountain to have him as priority God and God's glory and the cause of Jesus to proclaim him to the rest of the world and how much more are we asked to do that especially in our context where people are dying they need the gospel they need to hear the gospel please bow with me and let's pray it's going to end by reading the last bit of Psalm 103 again as for man his days are like grass he flourishes like a flower of the field for the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all bless the Lord O you his angels you mighty ones who do his word obeying his voice the voice of his word bless the Lord all his hosts his ministers who do his will bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion bless the Lord O my soul Lord we commit ourselves to you we pray for your mercy and we pray for your grace and we thank you that it is available for us in Jesus and we pray Lord that we your ministers of the gospel that we will bless your name 
as we share, as we speak about Jesus to people, as we live out this priority, this cause, this truth in every aspect of our lives. Lord, I pray, take our lives and weave through it, through all the areas of our lives, that this cause of the gospel, this priority of God's glory. So whether we are at work or at school or our family or of our children or our social environment, may Jesus and the gospel be ever before us as we interact. For God's glory we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.